Thank you, God. Thank you and praise you. My name is Slomo Phillips from AllFaith.com. I'm currently offering <laughs> this type of kippah. It's a little bit small for my head, I think. Uh, I'm, I'm currently offering uh, my ongoing study, The Great Awakenings, The Essence of Contemporary American Religion. Here, this is going to be another one of those broadcasts. In the study, I'm now on part 22. It's by Shlomo Phillips, me, copyrighted 1989. The most recent update was February 26, 2015. As I've been reading over these, I realized I probably should do another update pretty soon. But for now, this is as it appears, and I think this is good enough. <laughs> so I hope you'll enjoy it. As always, if you have any questions or comments, I invite them on Facebook on the comments section. I'll pause periodically and check back to see if anybody is um, see if anybody's posting anything. Um, if not, I hope that you will just watch and enjoy it as it continues. In this study, I am taking a more of an objective viewpoint about the history of religious expression as it developed in the United States. So um, I'm going to be covering a lot of material that concerns other religions and especially Christianity. If you watch the entire series, I think it'll all make sense as we go along. Again, your questions or comments are welcome. Let's begin. The Third Great Awakening Begins The Third Great Awakening occurred just prior to the onset of the First World War. It had profound impact on American and global religion. As a direct result of this Third Awakening, the future was fundamentally altered as a plethora of religious innovators appeared on the scene, setting the stage for the religion of the 20th and 21st centuries. This period was in some ways reminiscent of the first century BCE and CE, when messianic fervor led many people to messianic claimants. Just as the first centuries BC and CE failed to produce the yearned for Messiah, however, so too the Third Great Awakening. Just as the first centuries BCE and CE forever altered Judaism and the world, so too the Third Great Awakening has radically altered everything. Some of these new religious leaders emerged, rather, some of these new religious leaders encouraged the best in humanity. Some encouraged the worst. Whereas the two previous Great Awakenings, there had always been a basic theological and Christian consensus, in the third, few doctrines were accepted as sacrosanct. The assumption was not that religious people worship Jesus. Everything now was open for debate. Everything was being redefined, debated, and challenged. McLaughlin, who is a great uh, teacher of religious history, maintains that this period didn't really begin until 1890, but most people date it from the 1870s, and I follow that principle. The plethora of camp meetings that erupted around 1857, McLaughlin argues, does not qualify as a true awakening because of its limited impact and scope. I'll yield to his opinion here. However, by 1875, there was clearly a major awakening underway. Let's consider some of the people who made this awakening a reality. D.L. Moody and the Fundamentalist Following the Second Great Awakening, American Christianity had largely returned to a state of spiritual slumber. Those who were, quote, in the church generally remained in the pews inside the church, while those outside the church remained outside in a state of mutual truce with them. Calvinism began making a slight comeback during this period. It was simply soothing to trusting God 
without having to take personal responsibility for one's salvation. You'll recall from the last broadcast that Calvinism teaches that a person is either chosen by God before the foundations of the world, or the person is eternally lost, and it doesn't really matter what you believe as an individual. The decision was already made. The monumental successes of D.L. Moody's revival meetings in the 1870s reflect the powerful birth of missionary Christian fundamentalism. Moody, in fact, has been called the first Christian fundamentalist. In the Third Great Awakening, this Great Awakening was born among people of faith, although it reached far beyond. Like his Protestant forebears, Moody's fundamentalist teachings were based squarely on his literalist interpretations of the Bible. In other words, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. There was no room for debate in Moody's mind. This remains the defining position of all Christian fundamentalists. This conviction often includes the doctrine known as the, quote, priesthood of all believers, wherein Christian fundamentalists are taught to read the Bible, often the King James Version only, and to accept what it says literally, and to hold that dogmatically. Being trained in fundamentalist interpretation, these Christians usually see what their sect believes is written there in the process of their reading. Offering a different understanding of these texts will often result in rejection and condemnation rather than open-minded discussion and study. They are not, therefore, actually biblical literalists. They are doctrinal literalists. They see what they want to see in the pages of the Bible, including our Torah and Tanakh. Moody and his followers successfully created a transdenominational movement that continues to grow today. His doctrinal worldview is, in the mind of Christian fundamentalists, quote, mere Christianity. To reject this version of the religion is viewed as rejecting God himself. Dwight L. Moody lived 1837 to 1899. He battled toe-to-toe -to -toe with the intellectuals of his day. He rejected the rationalism of Das auf Ungerling, the Enlightenment. He likewise opposed the mainline emotionalism and neo-pagan spirit that he saw within Romanticism and modern liberal Christian theology, with its so-called higher criticism of the Bible that calls everything in the Bible into question. For Moody, the Bible was set in stone. Along with his longtime associate and song leader, Ira David Sankey, who lived August 28, 1840 to August 13, 1908, Moody condemned the doctrine of predestination, or Calvinism, and the cardinal teachings of the Calvinist. He also rejected the popular teaching of, quote, salvation by works, expressed by some segments of what we today would call the religious right. Moody also condemned the new secular humanist doctrines of evolution. He further rejected the Enlightenment notion of essential human goodness, returning, as he saw it, to the fundamental belief in the doctrine of original sin, which, by the way, was created by Augustine and is not biblical, and the necessity of being born again through the blood of Jesus. Dwight L. Moody was the father of Christian fundamentalism. From today's perspective, it is difficult to, appre to appreciate just how amazingly widespread the acceptance of his audience was to his views. Dwight L. Moody's teachings and the Bible Institute that he founded held a far more important place in this awakening than most people seem to realize. Moody led the way for the Christian fundamentalism that we know today and to the near destruction and death of Calvinism. He also fathered the zeal for missionary work that is such a plight today in Israel among the Jews and other people. That was part 22 of The Great Awakenings, The Essence of Contemporary American Religion by Shlomo Phillips, copyright 1989. We continue with part 23. William Miller. William Miller, 1782 to 1849, was a charismatic American Baptist preacher. His spiritual descendants are sometimes known as Millerites. His Adventist teachings, in other words, focusing on the second advent or coming of Jesus, of the 1830s and 40s, were very influential later on. 
It's largely because of Miller's significant influence that I'm inclined to date this awakening back to the 1840s. His impact in the Third Great Awakening and beyond was profound. His humility in acknowledging some of his mistakes later, mistakes that his followers continue making today, was really beyond admirable for a person in his position. Among Miller's spiritual heirs are several major religious denominations and sects, including the Seventh-day Adventist, the Advent Christians, and the International Bible Students Association, or Russellites, Jehovah's Christian Witnesses, Zion's Watchtower, etc., although it should be noted that the Russellites are a step removed from Reverend Miller. Miller's early beliefs were a mixture of Baptist theology and Masonic deism. Around 1850, Miller claimed to have had experienced a spiritual realization while reading from the Bible at his local church. The War of 1812 had left him, had left him questioning the afterlife and the meaning of human existence. It was a horribly bloody war. He was deeply troubled by the doctrine of eternal punishment and was seeking understanding. In my opinion, despite the pain caused by, to so many people through his movement, Miller himself was doubtless a sincere spiritual seeker who simply lacked the resources he needed and whose followers went well beyond what he intended. Personally, I hold William Miller in deep respect, despite the things that were done in his name. Because of his believed revelation, Miller became convinced that God had chosen him to reveal the end-time secrets to the world. As a result, he undertook serious Bible study. He began at Genesis 1-1 and worked his way forward. In this way, Miller determined what he believed the Bible said for himself without relying on others, and he began teaching his sometimes novel interpretations to others. Miller attracted quite a following with his end-time prophecies and unique doctrines. His teachings were unorthodox enough to convey the feeling of mysterious revealed truth, and yet orthodox enough from the Christian perspective to not seem like abject heresy. To many people, it seemed like a good fit for the chosen nation and its approached as it approached the year 1900. Many people consider William Miller to be a special prophet of God, and the idea that through him, America might just yet become New Zion after all, began to be heard. In time, Miller left his Baptist fellowship and his Masonic beliefs. He reportedly told a deist friend that if he would give me all the time, I would harmonize all the apparent contradictions to my own satisfaction, or I would be a deist still. Like so many others of the period, Miller felt that he needed to reinvent the wheel according to his own revelations. In September of 1822, Miller prophesied, I believe that the second coming of Jesus is near, even at the door, even within 21 years, on or before the year 1843. The result of this pronouncement was like a whirlwind. Beginning in 1840, Millerism became a significant religious force in the U.S. and one of the main prophets of the third great awakening. Miller later narrowed the scope of his wildly possible Daniel 9 prophecy. He announced to his followers that Jesus Christ would definitely physically return to the earth, cleanse, purify, and take full possession of it sometime between March 21, 1843 and March 21, 1844. There was no doubt about it, he said. When that date didn't pan out, a new date was revealed to him, April 18, 1844. The corrected date was set for seven months later, on October 22, 1844. With this prophecy, Adventist preacher Samuel S. Snow, 1806-1890, established what was known as the Seventh Month Movement to proclaim the final date of Jesus' advent. In, de in defense of Miller, 
Snow proposed that the delay had been the stripping away of those Adventists who lacked faith in order to establish and strengthen the rest as the foretold faithful remnant. When Jesus again didn't appear on October 22, 1844, that date came to be known as the Great Disappointment. To his credit, Miller publicly admitted his errors, although he explained that his miscalculation had been based on imprecise biblical preservation and records rather than his own research. Until his death on December 20, 1849, Miller fully expected the Lord's imminent return. The Millerites were understandably heartbroken at the great disappointment, and the majority left the Adventist cause. And yet, the Adventist cause lived on. Following the lead of Samuel Snow, the Millerites sought God for understanding. What had happened? It was obvious that Miller had been wrong, and yet his spiritual evidence seemed impeccable to them. Among those who continued to hold on to Miller's basic calculations are the Seventh-day Adventist Church, with over 14 million members and growing, and the Advent Christian Church, with around 61,000 members. Jay's witnesses, as well as many mainline Protestant sects, continue to study Daniel 9, believing that it holds the secret of Jesus' imminent return. All of these people are looking at the original research, or inspired by the original research, of Miller. I have a study on my website about Daniel 9. It is at allfaith.com slash Mashiach with an O slash dan9.html. It's linked on this page, which explains what that prophecy is actually about. It actually has nothing to do with the coming of the Messiah. This ends part 23 of The Great Awakening, The Essence of Contemporary American Religion by Shlomo Phillips, copyright 1989, part 24. Prophet Ellen White Those who remained loyal to Miller's teachings and calculations had to come up with an answer for this catastrophic failure of the Great Disappointment, and they did. They explained that Miller's dates were indeed correct, however, there had been a misunderstanding about the phrase, the cleansing the sanctuary. Many of the remaining Millerites explained that 1844, Jesus had in fact entered into the holy sanctuary and had begun what they called investigative judgment in preparation for the end of time. This is what Miller discovered. He was accurate, and it did indeed happen, they claimed. But Miller had lacked understanding of the investigative judgment and thought that that date would signal the physical coming of Jesus to the earth. One problem with this explanation is that the Seventh-day Adventists, like all fundamentalists, claim to be biblical literalists. This bizarre doctrine has absolutely no biblical support whatsoever. Indeed, from a literal reading, the teaching is pointed to by Jesus as a significant end-time heresy. Jesus is quoted in the Gospels in Matthew 24, 26, and 27 as saying, Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chamber, believe it not. For as lightning comes out of the east, and shines even to the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Notice the phrase, If they say, Behold, he is in the secret chamber. That's precisely what the Seventh-day Adventists claim. They claim that Jesus entered into the secret chamber for investigative judgment before returning to the earth. This teaching, if you want to be a biblical literalist and you accept the New Testament Gospels as inspired writ, which of course we don't as Jews, you'd have to say that the Adventists are teaching exactly something that Jesus specifically condemned. If Jesus is referring to himself here, which all the Christians say he is in Matthew chapter 24, then he clearly is not in the heavenly secret chamber, as the Adventists teach. The White's Revelation did not solve certain organizational, rather, the White's Revelation did solve certain organizational problems, however. And the Seventh-day Adventists and its offshoots, such as the Branch Davidians, continue to teach this to this day. How long this investigative judgment will take, 
apparently is anyone's guess. But be you aware the time is at hand, or so they continue to declare. This very odd doctrine could be attributed largely to James White, the husband of Ellen White. As the Whites and others continued reinterpreting their founders' teachings, Adventists like Joseph Bates discovered that Christians, like Jews, are commanded to honor the Biblical Sabbath, or Shabbat, in part to recast the movement as more than a failed single-issue sect, Sabbath observance then became very important in Adventist teachings. I discussed the Sabbath in, on my website as well in pretty good detail, what it is, where it came from, and how to, how to, how to observe it. Uh, do be aware, by the way, that Gentiles, non-Jews, are never required or even encouraged, really, to observe the Sabbath. The Sabbath is the day of remembrance to for, Jew, for Jews of our covenant with Hashem. But the Seventh-day Adventists did not embrace Sabbath observance, Seventh-day observance, until after the failed prophecy. And the failed prophecy gave them a way to deal with the inaccuracy of their teaching. The Seventh-day Adventist denomination was officially established in 1863. They claim to be the remnant church of biblical prophecies at places like Revelation 12, 17. And they believe that Ellen White held, quote, the spirit of prophecy in a unique way that surpassed even that of William Miller, who doubted his own revelation. Their 28 fundamental beliefs state in part, quote, Mrs. White's writings are a continuing and authoritative source of truth which provide for the church comfort, guidance, instruction, and correction. Her teachings, therefore, are deemed to be essential for understanding the Bible, which is considered to be the final authority by the Adventists. But without her teachings, you cannot properly understand the Bible. Like Jay's Christian Witnesses and other Third Great Awakening movements, the SDA believes that prior to taking human birth, Jesus was, a Mike, was the Archangel Michael. Most Christians consider this idea to be blasphemous, and they don't know what they believe about Jesus' pre-existence. But like other Millerites, the SDA originally accepted a basic Arian theology. As we discussed above, or previously, uh, Bishop Arius, actually we had not discussed that yet, as we will discuss below, uh, Bishop Arius, who lived 20, 250 to 256 to 336 CE, maintained that Jesus was fully human and was not at all divine. Like Judaism and the Bible, Arianism maintained a strictly monotheistic theology. There is only one indivisible eternal God. Where Jesus fits into the equation varies with the group, but he is not viewed as God, nor part of a trinity, according to most Millerites, and the orig as original teachings, according to the Whites. Those teachings, however, have been changed, and today many Millerites are Trinitarians, but they were not for many years. As Millerism declined and SDA missionary work and, in, and influence increased, the Seventh-day Adventists began courting acceptance from greater Christendom. At the time, most Christians considered the SDA to be a cult. Like most Christian fundamentalists, doctrinally, SDA views Catholicism as an abomination. In fact, the Seventh-day Adventists goes farther in that belief than the majority of Protestant Christians. SDA stresses this view more adamantly than most and believes that Catholicism will have a very dark role to play in the events at the end of days. The Adventists wanted to be accepted into mainstream American religious life and they were willing to negotiate their doctrines to achieve this goal. The SDA decided to embrace the deity of Jesus in order to be accepted by the rest of the church. The Jays Witnesses of course, still do not accept that teaching. The Jays' witnesses are Arians. Most Christians then and now believe as a primary article of faith that if one does not accept Jesus as God incarnate, may God forgive my, for me for saying so, one is by definition not a Christian. And so the SDA disregarded the Bible and amended their views. However, what they now believe goes well beyond what even Constantine dared to hope for. Most Christians will tell you that they are monotheists, that they only believe in one God. They see Jesus as part of a Godhead consisting of one God 
but in three persons. This is not biblical monotheism, but it's not classic pantheism either. The SDA doctrine is so far removed from both Christianity and biblical religion that it bears considering. I had an email discussion with actually a few different SDA pastors, but I want to share a snippet that I received from one. This particular SDA pastor is one of the leading pastors in one of their larger churches in the United States. He and I discussed their belief on Jesus. I asked the pastor for permission to share our conversation. He said I could, but he asked me not to identify him. So I'm going to honor that request. My question to him, do you believe in the, quote, Holy Trinity? The pastor, no. The Trinity is a Catholic and anti-biblical doctrine. Question, do you believe Jesus is God? SDA, of course. Question, do you believe the Holy Spirit is God? SDA, of course. Question, do you believe in the God of the Hebrew Bible? SDA, it goes without saying. Question, so you are like the, Uni the United Pentecostals and believe in Jesus alone as God, but that he is sometimes called by different titles? Is that the belief? SDA, no, that is also wrong. There is, there is God the Father, there is God the Son, and there is God the Holy Ghost. Question, but no Trinity? SDA, correct. There are three gods. Question, so you folks are polytheist? SDA, no, because we believe the three gods are in full accord. Unlike the majority of Christians, the Seventh-day Adventists are literal polytheists. They believe in and worship three separate gods. Not in the historic and unbiblical trinity sense, believed by most Christians, but in three literal separate gods. Whether the three gods are in accord, or they are three distinct gods, it is still not the one god of the Bible. Their belief is direct polytheism. I followed up on this by visiting the local, uh oh, I've moved, but, but he was the local, my local pastor when I lived in California, the, not my pastor, the pastor of the local Seventh-day Adventist church, and so I went, over, I went over there, and I asked the pastor if I could just ask him a couple of questions, and he agreed, hesitantly. I had a reputation there, I guess. <laughs> uh, but I asked the pastor, so you believe you're going to go to heaven. When you get to heaven, and God is there in front of you, what do you believe you're going to see? And the pastor told me, there will be three thrones, and there will be one God seated on each throne. And those three gods will be in complete agreement about everything. That's the Adventist belief. That is absolute polytheism that absolutely violates what the Bible says. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. God is one, Echad. God is not three. While most Christians embrace the belief in one God, mysteriously, eternally manifested in three forms as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Adventists are literal polytheists, and they worship Michael the Archangel, who they believe was also God or Jesus. Unlike the Seventh-day Adventists, Jay's Witnesses and several of the other Millerite sects maintain their Aryan beliefs and reject the belief that God ever incarnated as a man. Doctrinally, the Aryans are closer to Judaism and biblical religion than most other Christian sects. This is not an endorsement. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying here. But one of the biggest divides between Judaism and Christianity is the belief of Christianity that Jesus was God incarnate. The Jay's Witnesses and some of these other Millerite groups reject that teaching. And here ends um, part 24. We continue with part 25. Of the Great Awakenings, The Essence of Contemporary American Religion by Shlomo Phillips, copyrighted 1989. Checking over in Facebook, don't see any questions or comments over there. And so we will continue. Charles Taze Russell and the International Bible Students and Jay's Christian Witnesses. The reason I say Jay's Christian Witnesses is that the name of the Holy One, blessed be he, whether it is translated 
with the Hebrew letters or with some transliteration such as the name J is not to be lightly spoken, and so I'm not going to speak those names. So I will be referring to that group as J's Christian Witnesses. Charles Taze Russell, who lived February 16, 1852 to October 31, 1916, was a deeply religious man from his earliest years. As a child, Russell attended services at the local Presbyterian church. At 13, he joined a congregational church, and by the age 16, he was committed he was a committed and dissatisfied religious seeker and skeptic. He could not accept what was being taught him from the Christian pulpits. By his mid-teens, Russell was studying Confucianism, Buddhism, Taoism, and Hinduism, but his cursory studies convinced him that these two were unsatisfactory. At 18 years of age, Russell attended an Adventist meeting, a Millerite meeting, held by Jonas Wendell, who lived 1815 to 1873, and he enthusiastically embraced the 1874 date for the, quote, rapture of the church. Russell's faith in Christianity had been restored. He delved deeply into the writings and teachings of William Miller and his associates, and like so many people, he was excited about the promised soon advent. In 1876, Russell read the influential Adventist writer and publisher Nelson H. Barber, who lived 1824 to 1908, and his book, or his magazine actually, Herald of the Morning, and he believed that he had finally found true Christianity. Miller restored his faith, and this can, or his, um, the Herald of the Morning articles restored Miller's faith, and convinced him that in 1878, Jesus would in fact return and rapture him away to heaven along with the true church, and then would conduct a thousand global year devastation in preparation for the coming of the Messianic Kingdom. The Adventist doctrine on the thousand years following the Armageddon is different from most Christian interpretations and frankly makes less sense than theirs, in my opinion. It also is not harmonious with biblical understandings as we understand it as Jews. Like so many others, Charles Taze Russell sold all of his belongings and he donated the money to Barber to help spread the word. He was now a committed Adventist. <clears throat> that same year, Russell began to write his own papers. His first published work seemed to have been The Object and Manner of Our Lord's Return. Inspired by the Adventist prophecy, Russell became, a dedicated, became dedicated to the promulgation of his own writings. He was a missionary at heart. In time, Russell and Barber parted ways, both physically and spiritually. Russell stopped supporting Barber and began publishing his own teachings under the titles Studies in the Scriptures. Zion's Watchtower and Herald of Christ's Presence was first issued in July of 1879. Russell continued his ministry and Barber formed the Church of the Strangers that same year. Barber continued to publish his Herald of the Morning. Based on his own studies of Daniel 9 and other texts, Russell's unique Arian doctrines found followers from within the Adventist movement and beyond. His initial views centered around the Adventist Millerite belief that the world, the present evil system of things, to use their terms, was destined to end shortly. But, he said, it would be on or around October 1st, 1914. Miller, uh, Russell offered support for his belief with uh, Milleresque interpretations of the Bible and his own mystical analysis of the Great Pyramids of Giza. Russell believed that the mysteries of the universe had been hidden within the pyramids of Egypt. In 1881, Zion's Watchtower and Tract Society was founded as the vehicle for Russell's teachings, and in 1884, the organization was legally chartered. There were now hundreds of Russellites spreading his teachings, and Russell came to be known as the pastor. As his fame spread, the pastor began receiving global recognition accolades, and of course, condemnation from the Christian world. His critics complained that much of what he was teaching was heretical. Chief among these was his belief in Arianism, the denial of Jesus' divinity, one of the things that he had gotten right, I might add. 
Not only was Jesus not to be accepted as the third person of a trinity, Russell was teaching that he was not God at all, and that in fact, he was the physical manifestation of the archangel Michael. While many Millerites believed that, most Christians didn't know it, didn't know that they did. Because of Russell's denial of the Trinity and his belief in Jesus as Michael the Archangel, his detractors had ammo to use in their battles against him. To his credit, the pastor never wavered in his beliefs. Major events, however, did happen in 1914 at about the time that Russell pointed to, not the least of which was the onset of the First World War. But when 1914 passed, without the advent occurring, a viable answer was needed. The Watchtower Society came up with a good answer, they figured. They explained that Jesus did in fact return to the earth in 1940, just as predicted. His advent, however, had been invisible. While the SDA still had Jesus secluded in heaven, the witnesses had him here on earth, living invisibly in a New York skyscraper. Seriously, they believe that. In a move all too reminiscent of the SDA's investigative judgment, uh, judgment justification, the Watchtower Society claimed that on the way to the earth, Jesus had to battle the forces of Satan. Good news, though, Jesus had won the fight and had bound Satan to the earth, lest he escape God's wrath. He based this on Luke 10, 18. The bad news was that the battle between Jesus and Satan had been so intense that it had caused the First World War. Obviously, the Watchtower, or the true Jews as they now consider themselves to be, had triumphed. The war to end all wars marked the event of Jesus' return. The last days had now formally and finally begun, according to Russell. The still invisible Jesus was now living in the Watchtower headquarters and awaiting the time by God to wage Armageddon. According to Zion's Watchtower, Jesus indeed had returned in 1914, just as the pastor said. He merely had done so invisibly, so as to prepare for his work of global restoration. Russell's end-time followers, composed of 144,000 faithful and discreet servants, were granted additional time to preach his message unto all the ends of the earth. Matthew 24:14 is a foundation for that false claim. All the wars, natural disasters, and bloodshed that have occurred since 1914 are those that were predicted in the Bible by Jesus in Matthew 24 and elsewhere. Russell's prophecies and the explanation of its apparent failure may seem far-fetched at first, but when you consider his sources and rationale, coupled with the apocalyptic excitement of the day, it is understand understandable how millions of people, including the mother of President Dwight D. Eisenhower, came to accept his predictions and interpretations and to commit their lives to their promulgations. Pastor Russell died on October 31, 1916, aboard a train from apparently natural causes. In January of 1917, Judge Joseph Franklin Rutherford became the new leader of the Watchtower Society. Almost at once, Judge Rutherford began altering Russell's teachings and major controversies arose within the Watchtower Society. Among the teachings the judge rejected was Russell's use of pyramidology. As early as 1918, there were dissenting voices being heard within the Watchtower Society. Soon, around three quarters of the congregations had rejected the judge's reforms, but the judge held firm as the anointed leader of the sect. The judge's rejection of Russell's personal role in the restoration of the truth in February of 1927 and his whole rejection of the Great Pyramid beliefs in November of 1928 resulted in an irreparable split within the group. In 1931, the Bible students who remained loyal to the judge's reforms adopted a new name, Jay's Christian Witnesses. Soon, they changed the name of their society to the International Watchtower Bible and Tract Society, also known as the International Bible Students Association of Jay's Witnesses. The judge changed the congregational structure from independent study halls to autocephalic communities to a highly structured hierarchy run by the society's appointed leaders. 
These elders were pronounced to be the faithful and discreet slave class, of which, as president, he was the head. Unlike the SDA, neither Russell nor Rutherford were viewed as prophets. Revelation was found in the research of the faithful and discreet servant class. This still remains the case today. While there are still some Russellite Bible student study groups, such as the Don Bible Students Association, the organization restructured by Judge Rutherford remains the primary successor of Charles Taze Russell. I actually have a friend here on Facebook whose wife is a member of the Don Bible Association, and if you're listening and you'd like, feel free to uh, post a link to hook people up to that group for more information. I'm not going to do that. Now, while there are differences, like Samuel S. Snow, Ellen White, and others, Russell was essentially a Millerite Adventist who carried the teachings into their next yet logical direction. And I'm going to go ahead and end this here. Next time, we will continue with Calculating Armageddon. Discussing Armageddon. Um, I am going to continue doing this tomorrow. Let's shoot for around 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, or Eastern Time for those who are wanting to watch it live. So let's say 11 o'clock tomorrow morning, I will continue with part 26 of the Third Great Awakening with Calculating Armageddon. Until then, thank you for watching. I hope that you're uh, being inspired by these studies, and um, if you are, drop me a PM or give me a note here to let me know that you're watching and listening and that this material is to you interesting. I'm going to close with Benny Friedman's Toda. Toda, thank you, Hashem, for everything that you've done. And thank you, friends, for watching. My prayer is that God would bless you that he would keep you, and that he would cause his face to shine evermore upon you. Thanks a lot. I'll see you next time. God bless.
the music and the rhyme, you're the rhythm and the time, so da lecha. I know that there's a reason and a plan, and so I try the best I can to make you proud. So all the friends I made along the way, let me hear you sing it out loud. See you next time, friends. Toda.